Hello, this is Rick Crawford of the San Diego Public Library, and today we're going to talk about the history of the library. This has been a civic institution since 1882, and we're going to go back in time and see how it developed over the years. So let's just get started. So here we're looking at San Diego in 1850, and this is, uh, we would call this old town today, of course, it was just San Diego in 1850. We didn't have good photographs for this early period, but we have a wonderful sketch by a man named Powell, who was an immigrant from the Northeast, that took the Southwest Trail all the way to San Diego and on into the rest of California. When he was in San Diego, he did several black and white sketches of the area, and this is a colorized sketch that shows us what the town looked like at that time. And again, this is a, a very small town. We had the gold rush in California already, which brought huge numbers of people to Northern California, San Francisco, of course, Sacramento. San Diego didn't benefit too much, not initially from the gold rush. We had about 700 people at the time, and it would grow very slowly in the 1850s. By 1854, however, we did have a newspaper in town. This was the San Diego Herald, and the Herald makes the point in 1854 that we needed a library in town. And uh, this may be difficult for some of you to read on the screen. Let me just read a bit of it. Uh, this is an editorial asking for a circulating library. And they're making the point that a library, I'm quoting here, a library of useful knowledge is of great importance, none will deny that together with the organization of a common school places us within the pale of civilization and cannot be dispensed with in this age of improvement. So they were after a library as a means uh, of generating uh, respect as a community. They wanted schools, they wanted a church, and they wanted a library. And nothing happened, of course. The library did fell apart. The idea just didn't go anywhere. It did not get started again until Alonzo Horton came to town. And Alonzo Horton is a furniture salesman from San Francisco that made a trip to San Diego by the steamer in 1868 and decided right off the bat that the city was located in just the wrong place. And he looked at the, the, the land closer to the port and decided that's where the city of San Diego had to go. And he proceeded to buy up about a thousand acres of downtown San Diego and began developing the city. One of the uh, one of the things that Horton brought to us that was very important was his own personal library and he even had uh, a catalog of his library. This is the Horton Library catalog handwritten. We actually have this today in our special collections room which you could you could look at sometime. This is how it was organized. It was handwritten, of course, in those days. And it was basically just an inventory of his collection of, of about 800 books. Now, Horton had promised to uh, donate his collection, his personal collection of books, to a new library. And there was some discussions of that over a period of time. And a library association was formed. However, at the last minute, Horton decided that he did not want to donate the books, he wanted to sell the books, and that created a lot of ill feelings, and uh, the idea fell apart. Uh, but nonetheless, by 1882, there was another effort to start a public library, and this time they really got it off the ground. And you're looking at the uh, southwest corner of 5th and G Streets, and this is a building that's still there. You can still go and see this building. It looks a bit different today, and I'll show you a, a better view of it uh, down the road a bit, uh, but this is what the public library looked like when we began in April 1882. If you look upstairs in here, and I don't know that you can see this very well, but we have windows up here that will say public library in the window, and uh, that's where we had rent-free rooms from this area. This, this building was called the Commercial Bank Building, and we would be here for several years. This was a spot where we shared uh, quarters with uh, a drugstore, a grocery store, a dentist, as well as the bank. And the library was just upstairs. In 1887, we got our first librarian. We had actually had uh, a few caretaker people before Lulu Yonkin arrived. We'd had a janitor slash librarian that watched the collection and we had a local attorney 
who actually served as librarian for a few years. Uh, that man named, named Wooster uh, earned $10 a month to watch the library. But Lula Yonkin was a college-educated woman from Iowa, University of Iowa, came west uh, with her family in 1887 and was quickly hired as a librarian, and she was paid $70 a month. She was 28 years old at the time, so this was her start of her professional career. She was a very well-organized person, and one of her major accomplishments was compiling a catalog of the library. And this is what her catalog looked like. It was actually, like Horton's catalog, a, an inventory of the collection. And we, by this time, uh, in the late 80s, we had about 7,000 volumes in the collection. It had become quite a successful library and very well used by the public. Population had grown a bit. And remember, this is a time when we did not have TV, radio. We did not have outdoor entertainments like we have today. And so libraries got the kind of use that we can hardly imagine today. They were very popular, and circulation was really quite large. In 1889, uh, the library building was expanded greatly. And... Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but we now have a paved street down here, which was not, which was fairly new in the 80s. And paved streets finally came in, came in the late 1880s. This building got two extra floors to it, and it become, it would eventually become City Hall, as you can see on the corner there. But the library moved it up to the top floor, and now we're paying rent, and that begin, becomes uh, a bit of a hardship for the library. But the library was open. Every day of the week, they had a very generous library hours, uh, 9 till 9, Monday through Saturday, and Sunday afternoons, 1 to 4. So it would close at lunchtime so the staff could, could get dinner or, or lunch, but otherwise it had very generous hours. We're paying $150 a month at this time, and that was quite a jump from the rent-free rooms that we had when we began. Uh, and as I said, this became a bit of a problem. There were uh, two reading rooms in this library up on the top floor. There was a library room for uh, men and one for women. They segregated the sexes at that time, which was very common among libraries. Heaven forbid, you know, the sexes mingle while you're reading a book. Uh, but the books circulated. We had a circulation policy. Overdue books were five cents a day. And if you didn't return the book within a week, someone would come and fetch it from you and they charge you an extra quarter for having to do that. Uh, the expense of the old building, the old commercial bank building, became too much. And so the library moved to different quarters. This is the St. James Hotel at 7th and F Streets. We have a St. James today in San Diego. It is not the same location, same building, of course, but we were going to be, the library moved into quarters here for another five years. And for five years after that, we were in the Keating building at 5th and F Streets on an upper floor. And this building, of course, does exist today in the gas lamp quarter. You can see where the library was uh, up in an upstairs window. Here you actually can, maybe you saw the TV show a few years ago of Simon and Simon that was filmed in this very same building that had once been the public library. So at this point we're into the late 1890s and we're still looking for permanent quarters for the library. We've had this these rent, rented rooms for on three different occasions, three different buildings, and two people enter the picture that are going to be very important to library history. On the left, we have George Marston, who was a very successful local merchant. Uh, he ran for mayor twice, but was never elected to public office, did not win those elections. But he was always a very prominent figure in local politics, local education, civic affairs of all kinds, uh, a very good man for San Diego. And on the right, we have Lydia, Lydia Knapp Horton, who was the wife of Alonzo Horton. She's quite a bit younger than Horton. Horton is very elderly at this point. But Lydia Horton is uh, prominent in the Wednesday Club, which was a ladies group that looked for any way to improve their city. And one subject they took on was uh, finding a location, finding a building 
creating a building, if they could, for the public library. And Lydia Horton began writing letters to Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, uh, the wealthy steel magnate in the East Coast, had begun funding libraries all across the country, but he hadn't funded any library west of the Mississippi at, that, at this point. So her letter, I think she wrote to him the first time in 1897, and it got a good response. He was very interested in helping us. And uh, he committed $50,000 for a new library. His one stipulation, and he made the stipulation every time he offered money to a community, he wanted to make sure the city government supported the library. He did not want to see a library take his money to build a library that would not be supported. So San Diego made the promises, and uh, Carnegie offered his $50,000, which was later up actually to $60,000. And then you had a battle of where to site this new library. Where would we put our new Carnegie Library when it was built? And there was quite a, quite a bit of debate on that. What you're looking at here is the site of the Carnegie Library in the late 1890s. And what we're looking at here, this would be E Street. Uh, this is 9th, 8th Street would be over here. And this right here, this area here would be the site of the new library. It was an entire block that was available for sale to build a library, and the city eventually bought half the lot for $17,000. And this was quite controversial. George Marston advocated buying the entire block. He said the library is going to grow, the community will grow, you need more space. But he lost this particular argument, and so we bought our half acre land and that's where the new library would go. This is a very interesting picture, of course, because it shows buildings that I don't think any of these buildings exist anymore. You can see up in this far corner up here, that is San Diego High School. That was called Russ School. It was built out of lumber from the Russ Lumber Mill. And that's how the school looked like back in the 1890s. So this is the Carnegie Library that opened in 1902. What the city did was they put this out to bid and a New York architectural firm won the contract and as payment they were given a, uh, a percentage of the entire building project's budget, which I believe was about 5%. Local contractors for actually constructing this were Hebert and Gill. Hebert and Gill were both very prominent local architects. Irving Gill, of course, is remembered very well today, and this is one of the early projects that he worked on. Uh, the city of San Diego, when they opened this building, was about 17,000 people, and very small population, of course, but the library seemed to fit that size of population. If you look at the building here, uh, a few of our notable things here, still dirt streets for this part of town. We're kind of on the outskirts of town, actually, at this time. You've got some interesting trees going in here. These are palm trees uh, planted by Kate Sessions, no less. You've got uh, these little instruments here that were used for tying up your horse, and they would remain at the library uh, as long as the library was there. Here's a nice little article from the San Diego Union announcing that the library is ready to open. This was a Sunday in April in 1902, and the public got a preview that day. The library would open uh, for real uh, the very next day. We have a lot of wonderful pictures of the Carnegie Library over time. Uh, this is an early photograph, a bit later than the opening date. You can see the palm trees are growing up a bit, uh, still have a dirt street, still have a place to tie up your horse, but this is just a bit later. Uh, I'll remark on just the uh, the landscaping around. Uh, the trees were planted, as I said, by Kate Sessions. She was also responsible for the grounds. And uh, George Marston was still involved in this whole process. He paid Kate Sessions to do this work. Notice, too, this is a very small footprint uh, on the land. It's a half acre lot, but we have a lot of land around it because the library is not very small. It was a two story library and it had a basement. Here is the men's reading room. This is very early in the 1900s. We know that because at this point we were still segregating the sexes. Still a common 
uh, trade among libraries across the country. Uh, but this is uh, a wonderful picture, I would say, 1905 to 1910, something like that, of, of just the men's reading room. Here is some ladies at work in the Mendrian Bindery, which is a wonderful picture, I think. Uh, here they are with their aprons and working very hard to, to maintain the books around 1910, we would guess. This is a genealogy collection. One uh, type of material that we've collected for years is genealogy. We have a very large genealogy collection today in special collections, and this was the start of it way back in the early 1900s. This is the uh, famous Limburg Globe, and you should remember that Limburg came to San Diego in 1926 to supervise the construction of his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis. And uh, when he was in town for several months, he spent a lot of time at the public library, he became a very familiar figure at the library. And this globe, uh, according to, to legend anyway, was what he used to kind of map his his trip across the U.S. and then across the Atlantic to Paris. So long after Lindbergh was gone, this was called the Lindbergh Globe. Uh, when I first came to work for the, the library many years ago, I looked for this globe. I thought, it's got to be here. It's got to be down in the basement. And what I discovered was, from calling around, we had actually loaned this globe to the Aerospace Museum for an exhibit. They had, of course, they had a replica of the Spirit of St. Louis in their collection, and they wanted this to go along with that for a time. And unfortunately, you may remember, we had major fires in Balboa Park, and the Aerospace Museum burned to the ground and took the, the Limburg Globe with it, I'm afraid. One more note about this, uh, this gallery on the second floor. In 1909, we had a major theft of art from this floor. Uh, librarians came in to open the library one day and they found the frames strewn about on the floor. The paintings were all gone. And this was a, a major event locally. Uh, the San Diego police uh, chief uh, sent mailers throughout the West, uh, which was an inventory of what was lost. And uh, actually, they discovered the criminal by this. We got a message back from Los Angeles from uh, the police saying that they had someone in custody that had receipts for a warehouse. And uh, San Diego's police chief went up to LA, met with them up there, and they went and visited the warehouse with this receipt. And sure enough, all the artwork was up there. So this was all, all retrieved. There's another interesting shot that I like of uh, a reading room area, a reference area. We now have women alongside men, so that's, that's a change. It's kind of fun to see the photographs in, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the paintings that you would see throughout the library. We have some of these paintings today. This painting, for example, right over here uh, can still be found in the special collections room on the ninth floor of our, of our library. Again, we had very generous opening hours for the library. This is a street sign that's just a block from the Carnegie Library that shows the library is open nine till nine, almost every day of the week. I think at one time we were closed only on Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day. Otherwise, we were, we were pretty much open every day of the week. This is a fun photograph of the entire staff in front of the main doors of the Carnegie Library. Uh, notice that these are all women, uh, clerks, librarians, all women. There's one gentleman in the back row. I think you can see him. And uh, over here, we have uh, Althea Warren, who would become the city librarian uh, shortly after this. Althea Warren would go on to become the head librarian of the San Diego, or I'm sorry, the Los Angeles Public Library, and became very prominent in professional circles. And let's introduce you here to Clara Breed, who would, we'll talk about quite a bit more later in this presentation. But Clara Breed was a young librarian. Uh, she had come west with her family when she was young, graduated from San Diego High School, then Claremont College. She became uh, a children's library initially. Her first job was actually in a branch library in East San Diego. 
Then she came into the Central Library, the Carnegie Library, and became the Children's Librarian, where she was for many, many years. She would become uh, the library head librarian uh, later on, and we'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, I enjoy this picture. This is the uh, this is the children's uh, story time hour uh, in the Carnegie Library. The library had expanded uh, into other quarters besides the Carnegie Library. We had a building next door, and uh, this is where the children's department was. I just mentioned Althea Warren a moment ago. She came to the library in 1916, was head librarian for, until 1926, then she went to the Los Angeles Public Library. Cornelia Playster was a city librarian from 1926 until 1945, and uh, she was replaced uh, by Clara Breed, who would be librarian for the next 25 years after that. Another good photograph of the Carnegie Library, and notice how those palm trees have really grown up. You can still tie up your horse, however, down on that front lawn. A photograph of people waiting to get in to the library. This has always been something noticeable at the front doors of the library and whatever year you're looking at at the Central Library down here. We have crowds of people in the front doors. We're closed right now, of course, because of the virus, but uh, in normal times we'll have quite a few people congregating waiting to get in. These people, I must say, were much better dressed than the patrons we have today. And uh, every man is wearing a hat. I think I would have hated that, but they, they all have coats. Women are all very well dressed. And uh, even the later photograph of the library, and you can see some of the cityscape in the background, very mature palm trees. Another good look at how uh, how much room we had around the library. We had quite a, quite a bit of landscaping that was very nicely placed around the library. Uh, on the small footprint of the library itself. Here's the Carnegie Library in 1948, and we're getting close to the end, I'm afraid. The library had become very, very small. The population had grown enormously over the years. That second floor atrium that I showed you in the early picture had been roofed over, so we had more floor space on the second floor. But the, the place was just crammed. We were beginning to add branch libraries at this time, so that helped quite a bit. But the library itself was much too small. There was one bond campaign after another that always failed. Uh, there never seemed to be uh, the vote that the public would provide to provide the money. So it just wasn't happening for a long time. Branches uh, were an interesting feature, as I said, and that kind of alleviated some of the crowding at the Central Library. This was an interesting branch. This was actually a Marston's department store. We had rooms at the Marston store, and this was a very successful reading room for many years. And this is the La Jolla branch that opened in 1921. This is a very beautiful building, of course, and it's still there today. This is the Anthenaeum today in La Jolla, but it was our branch in 1921. Here's an early picture of the San Ysidro Branch Library. San Ysidro was a county library for a time before the city of San Diego annexed San Ysidro. Uh, it was originally created uh, by a man named Booz Byers. Byers who, which is a name that's still prominent in San Ysidro. I think there's a Byers Boulevard and there's been a Byers School. Uh, Booze Byers, as it was called, uh, made a whole lot of money in Tijuana, Mexicali, uh, with prohibition being very lucrative for such people. Uh, he made his fortune down below the border and uh, later years became quite a, quite a nice philanthropist and donated quite a bit to the San Ysidro community including their first library. Here is the East San Diego Branch Library in 1925. And this, uh, this building's long gone. East San Diego was his own community for a while and uh, became part of San Diego a bit later, then became a branch library for us. Here is the first Linda Vista Branch Library in 1942. This is wartime, of course, and Linda Vista 
area became a uh, an area where they built quite a bit of housing, so they needed a library, and this is how our, our first library looked there. Here's the storefront library in Burlingame area, the Burlingame branch on 30th Street. So let's get back to the central library. This is the library staff in 1945, and I still see suspiciously few number of men, but uh, anyway. Here we have in the front row, you can see there's Clara Breed. And 1945 was the last year that Miss Blaster was the city librarian. And she was very ill at the time this photograph was taken. Uh, my understanding from the caption on this picture is that they, the whole staff get together for this photograph for Miss Blaster, who was very ill. And they wanted to cheer her up with a big group picture. I've mentioned that Clara Breed was a children's librarian uh, for most of her early career in, in San Diego. What we're looking at here is the evacuation of Japanese Americans. Uh, they went off to camps in, in the Manzanar up north in California, but San Diego, uh, the Japanese Americans, and these are mostly citizens, uh, they were sent to post in Arizona. And before they left town, as they're ready to board the trains, Clara Breed was down there and she was sending, giving postcards to all of her children that she'd known from using the library downtown. And she said, please write to me. Let's keep in contact. So I, I'm including this photograph and the next one as a reminder that this is a very important story, and uh, Clara Breed is best known today nationally as the woman that really cared for this particular community, kept in contact with them, and uh, it's a very important San Diego story. This is where all of the Japanese Americans from San Diego ended up going. This is a very harsh desert uh, near the Colorado River, but in Arizona, very hot and dusty. Uh, it was a huge camp, 3,000 Americans. This is one one camp. You can see uh, a camp uh, more up here, and then we have uh, a lot down here. It, quite, it created quite an area, and this is where most Japanese Americans spent uh, the entire war. In 1948, we began adding bookmobiles and we would eventually have three of them. This is the first bookmobile. It would make trips to uh, schools, such as you see here. It would go to shopping areas, wherever the public could meet the, uh, the bookmobile. They would have a regular schedule, and these were quite popular. These were expensive to operate, but it was quite a successful story for us. Here's elementary school students in a bookmobile in, in 1964. It gives you a good idea of how much they could squeeze into one of these vehicles. And here is, the, here is the fleet on a parking lot in Balboa Park. The Carnegie Library, uh, as I mentioned, became quite small, quite, quite rapidly as the city population grew. This is one picture of the interior that shows what it was like inside the library. You had these incredibly narrow stairways and uh, shelving, shelving close, close together. One of the things that they did that really allevi alleviated some of the storage problems was they, they moved into an annex next door. What you're looking at here is moving the Fletcher building to the area uh, just next door to the library. Today, this is called Library Lofts. That building is still there next to the old Central Library. This building that you're looking at here was originally at the site of the post office downtown. And it was a two-story building, two-story brick building. They managed to pick it up, move it catty corner uh, to its current site. And they raised it up and stuck a floor underneath so it became a three-story building. And this is the, area, the building that contained uh, the business office, children's, cataloging. Here is the library annex at 9th and E Street after it had been fully placed in its, its current position. And here is what it looked like from the front doors, again, containing business offices, cataloging, children's, newspaper rooms. Here we are around 1950. 
or this could be 49. I don't have an exact date for this, but you'll see Clara Breed on the right down there. And she's consulting with library planners. Uh, we've got several people here that were quite important to the process. This is Lawrence Clobber uh, from the Library Commission. We have the architect up here, uh, various consultants and architects that were involved in planning the new library. And you'll see in the background you have here a rendering of the central library that we just moved out of a few years ago. And uh, they're looking at the plans for this upcoming construction. So the city of San Diego, to pay for this new library that was being planned, we had actually succeeded finally in passing a bond issue to provide the money for the new library. Here we are moving out of the Central, or I'm sorry, the Carnegie Library in the summer of 1952. They actually have bashed a window out on the second floor and they're sending boxes of books down the conveyor belt onto a truck. There's another view of that process. And down the Carnegie Library goes. Uh, when people have seen photographs of the Carnegie Library, they first remark, well, how could we have destroyed such a beautiful building? Well, it, it happened. And uh, there wasn't much comment from the community. We were anxious to get a new library. And uh, it went out without much controversy, I'm afraid. Here it is, uh, July 1952. As the caption says, it only took two days to knock down this library. Here's Clara Breed looking at the cornerstone contents. Uh, it used to be a common feature of older buildings, such as a library, where you would have a cornerstone where you would place items that were important of the day. So here we have items that were in a box in a corner of the library that contained items such as the, the daily newspaper, a current magazine perhaps, uh, messages from uh, the mayor or city council, and she's inspecting those items. Those items would go back into a box and they would go into the cornerstone of the central library. And frankly, those, that item, that box is still there at the old central library. So where do we go for those two years it took to build the new central library? This is the food and beverage building in Balboa Park in 1952. This is where we moved. Uh, today, this building is, I believe it's a children's theater. It was a large building, had huge spaces. Here we are with books laid out, getting organized before we open. Clara Breed supervising some of that process. And here we are underway in, that, in the food and beverage building in Balboa Park. And here's what the site of the old Carnegie Library looked like. We're starting to do excavations here. Gives you a good view of, of the area. If you look at the, the cityscape in the back, we have the El Cortez back here. And uh, that's about our only high rise, of course, at that time. Getting close to finishing the construction, we're up on the third floor by this point. This would be a three-story building that had two basement levels. One of the architectural features of, of the old Central Library is these bas-relief sculptures that would be on the outside of the building. These were done by Donald Horde, a very prominent local artist. These were actually poured concrete. And uh, this shows a picture of being lifted into place that would go on both sides of the entrance doors. Here's Dedication Day in June 1954, a Sunday afternoon. Here are those bows relief on each side of the building. This was a big event. Uh, this is Lawrence Clobber, head of the Library Commission, uh, giving some remarks here. Lawrence Clobber was actually also uh, president of San Diego Gas and Electric for many, many years. A picture on the post office side of the same crowd waiting to see the, the new central library. Circulation desk of the library. Those of us that have worked here uh, marvel at how, how clean and new it looked. It wasn't quite that same when we moved out of here several years ago. The card catalog in the old central library. 
So we're talking 1950s here, of course. And here's the newspaper room a little bit later. Uh, I marvel at the, uh, the microfilm equipment that we see here. You'll see this is where the reel of microfilm goes. You would hand crank these machines. There was no copying. You had to take your notes as you scrolled through the paper. Uh, the Central Library had a nice little auditorium up on the third floor that was very well used. We did not have enough space such as this in the Central Library, but this was uh, a small auditorium that had fixed seats uh, used quite a bit. One of the features of the art and music department on the second floor was these little rooms in the back, one back corner of the building, or, or the floor, you could actually listen to your, your records. You could check them out, you could listen to them in the room. We had record players, turntables in each of these rooms. Let's meet Julius Wangenheim. Uh, uh, Mr. Wangenheim was a local pioneer businessman, very successful, collected a lot of things, uh, including rare books. He collected coins, stamps, all kinds of things, but rare books were his passion. He was particularly interested in books about books. And uh, Mr. Wangenheim died in 1942. His widow donated much of his personal collection of books to the public library. And this went into the Wangenheim room up on the third floor of the old Central Library. And many of you, I hope, have visited this in years past. Uh, this is how it looked shortly after it opened. It had cork floors, which was very interesting. Beautiful uh, paneling, teak paneling on the walls. There's a little bit later picture of the room. We've now added some very important Persian carpets, which we still use today in our new library. These are rare Persian rugs, over 100 years old, and they were donated in the 1960s, along with a large collection of books, rare books, including uh, a major collection of forage painting books, which are something that you need to see if you visit us. And let's go back to Clara Breed yet again. Uh, Clara Breed followed Miss Placer in 1945 as a city librarian, and she would be the librarian for 25 years. Uh, Clara Breed was known for many things. She was known, best known nationally for her work with uh, the Japanese American community, particularly during World War II. But also, she was very active professionally, and one of the things that she was known for, she represented a lot of librarians that were very staunchly against censorship of any kind. And we had quite a controversy in the 1960s when this book came out, The Last Temptation of Christ. This is by Nikos Kazantzakis, and I'm sure I butchered that last name, but he was a very prominent a literary figure in the 1950s in particular. He's best known, I think, for the novel Zorba the Greek, which they made into a movie. Uh, Last Temptation of Christ uh, came out in America after he died, actually. He died in 57. This did not appear over here for several years, and it immediately sparked controversy because uh, the religious community, conservatives, uh, believe this novel which uh, discussed the humanity of Christ versus his divinity, uh, should not be read by anybody, should not be seen. And they demanded that this come off the library shelves. It should not circulate to anybody. So we had quite a local controversy over this. Uh, there was a meeting of the library commissioners in the auditorium of the Central Library. Uh, the community was all there to give pro and con on the controversy and Clara Reed was very staunchly uh, supporting the right of the library, the right of the public to see this book. This is a comment made from uh, a man that uh, really represented the, the community that did not want it on the shelf, arguing this is a book of defamation, of depravity written by an atheistic degenerate, degenerate mind, and yet it is honored with a place in the public libraries. Well, this is a Frankly, this man would later admit that he had not read the book. Uh, that's what he understood. Clara Breed took the position that most librarians would take. 
saying, we take no sides on matters concerning politics or religion. There is no record of any book ever being withdrawn from this library under pressure from any group. And not too surprising, the, uh, the community as a whole and the library commissioner supported Clara Breed in this and uh, did not let her remove the books or, or instructed her do not remove the book. And Lawrence Clubber made the, uh, the very prudent comment, uh, if you want to suppress a book, don't mention it at all. If you want to increase its popularity, ask that it be removed from library shelves. And of course, that's what happened. The book just flew off the shelves. Circulation was huge for many, many years. So we're into the 1960s. City of San Diego has done what it does. It grows and the library gets smaller as that happens. So here we have a very crowded main floor. This is close to the history section as you walked into the library. There's another photograph showing pretty much the same area. And once again, the city of San Diego is holding bond elections, trying to get money to build a new library. And this would happen repeatedly over actually several decades. And each of these bond measures would fail. It was not happening until finally, uh, we're in, uh, I came to work for the library in 1999 and we expected to move it into a new library at that time. I think our date was like 2007 was the target date. That didn't happen originally. That was going to be a site down by Kettner. What we ended up with uh, is probably a far superior site. This is, of course, close to, the, close to the stadium, Petco Park, and you have the trolley tracks up here. Good location for transportation. And here is the construction of the new library underway. Getting much taller, we moved from a three-story building with two basement levels to a nine-story building with two basement levels for parking. And the beautiful dome, which is a feature of the library. This towers over the ninth floor and on down on the, from the eighth floor, you have a huge reading room. And here is how it looks today from the street. I like this picture showing the library as it relates to the rest of the community. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of very tall skyscrapers now that kind of obscure the view, but that's what happens. And here, here is Petco Park over here. Just a bit on the interior of the building, this is something that we added to the new Central Library that made a huge difference to storage. This is the Special Collections back of house room where we store the California book collection. And uh, this movable shelving as it's being installed in this photograph makes a huge difference. We have 15,000 books on these shelves uh, and we would not have fit them into our space without the compact movable shelving. There's a shot of the rare book room. Uh, where I happen to be sitting as I'm doing this presentation for you. And this is another part of the reading room of, of Special Collections Rare Book Room. This table in the middle of the photograph is, is quite a feature. This is a eucalyptus table, eight feet long, enormously heavy. It took eight guys all day long to get it up to the ninth floor, too big for a freight elevator. So it was quite an achievement just to get it into the room. And you'll see the Persian carpets uh, are still being used and uh, a lot of exhibit space in this room. The room is sited very carefully. We don't get direct sunlight in this room. So we're able to keep a lot of books out in the area for people to see. picture of Central Library from uh, near the trolley tracks. So I want to conclude just by giving you some suggestions for more ideas on or more resources for the history of San Diego. This is a wonderful book that Clara Breed wrote on the history of the library uh, at the time of its centennial. And Clara Breed was actually an excellent writer. This is a very good read and you can check it out from the library and I would suggest you do that. And just a few more uh, citations for you if you want to research the history of the San Diego Public Library. 
There's Claire Breed over on the right looking at us around some books. And uh, you'll see a few links here that you can click on from our website. These are articles that I wrote for the San Diego Union several years ago that give a more give more detail on our interesting history. And that will conclude this. I hope you've appreciated uh, what we've learned today and uh, come and visit us soon.